Okay, here we are. Uh, we're, oh, okay. we are we are now uh, about a half hour off schedule, and I think uh, considering everything what's going on this afternoon, uh, we'll probably remain about that throughout the afternoon if uh, nothing else comes to take us further off schedule. I um, want to remind you of the uh, opportunities to help out Tesla Tech and get yourself uh, library copies of the DVD set, and that will be $100 off if you order them today. And yes, they will be done at the end of the conference, so uh, I think most people should be able to take those home with you. Um, and then we have the magazine sets. Those are um, $50 instead of $75 for the back issue bundles. And then also reminding you that on Sunday we have one additional speaker, uh, Verm Warwich, uh, the money system. Okay, so we're about ready to roll here. Um, our next speaker is Alan Greenberg. He's a medical doctor. He's from Maryland. He went to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, graduated from there a few years ago, and he trained in neurology and psychiatry, which is a very different combination out there. You find very few people who know both. And then he worked at the University of Minnesota Hospital and the University of Colorado Health Center, and then uh, he did three years of biochemistry research at the University of Maryland. He's practiced 30 years in neurology and psychiatry, and he's published papers on serotonin and behavior, which are, we had a little discussion about that on technical aspects. His papers are somewhat different from the mainstream thinking on that at this point. And he's, um, over the past five years, been selling oral chelation products through his company, Science Formulas, and he's also practicing in holistic health education. So here's Alan Greenberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and an honor. And uh, I uh, hope I'll be able to give you a good idea of uh, what's happening uh, in the world of toxic metals. Um, The left one should work. Most people don't realize the extent of uh, toxic metals and the pathogenesis of disease. But in, in uh, 1974, the World Health Organization uh, issued a report on toxic metals in which they stated that 82% of all chronic degenerative disease was actually caused by toxic metal poisoning. And that situation is probably still the case, although to a great extent it, it's been uh, really uh, contributed to uh, a great deal by the presence of toxic chemicals in the environment. And, um, and also the fact that our food supply has deteriorated greatly over the past uh, really 50 years or so. Uh, we have uh, contamination of our air, water, our soil, our food, and our consumer products. And uh, there are over 70,000 chemicals in use by industry. Uh, the Environmental Working Group reports that they find over 250 chemicals in each person tested. And I've done some testing of my own using bioacoustics, and the number is actually probably close to 700 or 750 chemicals in every, every one of them. Of course, they're not all uh, in, at high levels, but Nevertheless, there are a tremendous number of chemicals in the environment. And of course, big business uh, doesn't seem to 
be too concerned about it. In fact, uh, they seem to delight in the whole problem. Uh, I think I missed one. Um, we're told not to eat sharks, but I guess the sharks uh, are not too happy about eating us either. Uh, there are just uh, toxic metals everywhere. <laughs> How bad is the heavy metal contamination in these waters? Let's just say we started fishing with magnets. Uh, I had, I've had quite a bit of experience with uh, toxic metals. And around 1990, I experienced a high degree of dissatisfaction and frustration at the lack of progress in many of my patients. And uh, the, the group of patients that was treated with medications really didn't improve even though they took vitamins. And uh, almost all the person I found that uh, when I started looking at their hair analyses that the vast majority of chronic illness was associated with metal poisoning and almost all persons working with metal had more metal poisoning and that includes all the plumbers and, and uh, the auto mechanics and the welders and uh, any, anybody at all, machinists, uh, people soldering, people using uh, uh, any kind of metal tools. Uh, a high percentage of my patients had chronic fatigue, multiple chemical sensitivities, and they really couldn't tolerate synthetic chemicals. So I had to learn to use natural chelators and supplements to support metal excretion. And uh, last time I was in Utah, uh, a number of years ago, I guess it was at least five or six years ago, um, I. I attended an, an extraordinary lecture at, at a naturopathic medical convention. And uh, there are two gentlemen lecturing on mitochondrial dysfunction. And they showed that all these different metals and uh, a variety of synthetic chemicals and, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs and also trans fatty acids would cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And by mitochondrial dysfunction, what I mean is that the uh, mitochondria stopped producing ATP or had a reduced production of ATP and began producing free radicals instead. And of course, this caused an enormous amount of, of uh, oxidative stress. Uh, here, here are some occupations that are at risk for metal poisoning people in the building and maintenance trades, plumbers, electrical workers, carpenters, auto mechanics, printers, machinists, air conditioning and heating specialists, chemical workers, painters and artists, beauticians and hairdressers, welders, metal workers, miners, electronic workers, salvage and recycler workers, pest exterminators, um, dentists, dental assistants, their office staff, Opticians, computer technicians and users, chemists and lab technicians, bank tellers and cashiers, um, anybody who handled money, on, uh, who handled uh, metal on a regular basis. Uh, also, um, locations can be very critical. If you live near an electrical generating plants, especially coal fired plants, uh, there's a tremendous amount of mercury. Uh, that's put out by these, uh, these power plants. Uh, airports are a problem because uh, there's a huge amount of antimony produced by um, these jet engines. The combustion chambers of jet engines are lined with antimony to keep them from burning out prematurely. And uh, added to that, there's a, a whole lot of uh, uh, toxic material that comes from the, air, the uh, 
jet fuel itself. And then the chemical plants uh, are a bad environment and smelting plants. Uh, neighborhoods with high vehicle travel have a problem uh, from the exhaust fumes and because tires are made with cadmium and they're constantly disintegrating. So if you have hundreds of millions of tires disintegrating on your roadways every day, you can see how that could be a, a big problem. Uh, old homes with lead paint have long been recognized as a problem. Various laboratories uh, uh, use a lot of chemicals. Some of them actually use uh, mercury. Um, steel mills have, uh, have been a problem. We had a, a large installation uh, in Baltimore where I practiced medicine for many years uh, at Bethlehem Steel and all the workers from Bethlehem Steel had severe metal poisoning and a variety of, of uh, physical problems from that. Um, there are a number of factors that enhance metal toxicity. Uh, one of them is the number of different metals you're exposed to because each additional toxic metal you're exposed to will lower the toxic threshold of each, every other toxic metal. Uh, fluoride and fluorosilicates have been a huge problem because uh, fluoride does two things. It's a very potent uh, enzyme inhibitor. And uh, when I worked in a laboratory, we used to use fluoride to terminate our enzyme reactions. Uh, of course, the government says it's really good for you. Uh, the other thing fluoride does is uh, it's a it's long been known to be a thyroid inhibitor so that uh, if you have inhibition of your thyroid function it slows down all the metabolic reactions in your body it lowers your temperature and all the enzyme reactions in your body are very temperature sensitive and so if you if you lower your body temperature by even one degree you get a major decrease in the rate of the enzyme reactions. Uh, multiple medications are a big problem because each, med each medication that you take uh, causes mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you add the mitochondrial dysfunction from the chemicals and drugs you're taking, and you add that to the mitochondrial dysfunction that you get from the toxic metals, you have a really major problem. Uh, antibiotics are a big problem because they actually interfere with the excretion of toxic metals. And trans fatty acids uh, uh, affect the membranes of the mitochondrion so that when you get to about 15% trans fatty acids incorporated into the mitochondrial membranes, then the actual output of ATP drops about 30%. Uh, poor diet is a big problem. Uh, diet, uh, in order to make glutathione, which is uh, really important for detoxifying chemicals and metals, you have to have enough cysteine in the uh, diet. And if you don't eat meat, for example, people who, who are vegetarians will often get into trouble once they get exposed to excessive, medical, excessive uh, metals or chemicals. Uh, sedentary lifestyle is a problem because it seems to uh, slow down the rate of detoxification. Uh, trace mineral or, or vitamin deficiencies are important because uh, the trace minerals compete with, uh, with the toxic metals for various sites on enzymes and membranes. Uh, aging has been shown to be an important factor. Older people are much more sensitive to metal poisoning than younger people. And of course, hypothyroidism, as I said before, is a big problem. Um, now, about 10 years ago, I had a, a really bad health problem. I had a 70-pound weight gain. I was short of breath. I developed arthritis. 
My balance was impaired. I couldn't stand on one foot. I had multiple chemical sensitivities, so I couldn't stand to have perfume in the environment. I had developed atrial fibrillation. My speech was extremely slow, and my movements were slow. I had abnormal sleepiness and would fall asleep at the wheel. I had chronic athlete's foot that was resistant to treatment, really dry skin, chest pain, numbness and tingling of my extremities, carpal tunnel syndrome, cold intolerance, damaged knee cartilage, irritable bowel syndrome, the hair on my chest turned white and the hair on my head was turning gray, I had facial swelling, hypoglycemia, absent libido, recurrent infections, and I, I knew I was dying and I went to many different doctors and they didn't have a clue about what was wrong with me. Um, I, I must have seen 20 different doctors over a period of a couple of years and they said I just had to live with my illnesses. So I tried dieting and tried taking vitamins and didn't, nothing seemed to help. And uh, so it was pretty frustrating. Finally, uh, well, here's a typical situation. <laughs> the doctor's saying, well, I have no freaking idea what's going on. And he says that to the patient, it's chronic fatigue syndrome. Anyway, I finally ordered a hair analysis on myself and I had high levels of mercury, lead, and aluminum. And I went to a mercury-free dentist who did a, an oral mercury vapor test on me and it was high. So he removed my amalgam fillings and I started an oral chelation program and um, took a lot of natural substances, vitamin E and C and multivitamins and algae and glutamine and ALA and NAC, cilantro and, and got on a high sulfur diet and my health started to improve pretty dramatically. So within the next 18 months, most of my symptoms disappeared. And I was able to run again. I was able to go dancing. I lost weight without any difficulty. And all these diseases I had just melted away. It was pretty amazing. Um, I got, I was, of course, very interested in the whole question of chelation. And what I realized is that uh, most of the agents that we use for chelation today are synthetic chemicals, EDTA, DMSA, DMPS. But these actually were chemicals that were developed for the treatment of acute mental poisoning. And uh, these can be very helpful of, for someone who has acute mental poisoning. And um, uh, many patients have had their lives saved. But the problem is that if you look at the total group of people who have metal poisoning, probably 98 or 99 percent of these people have chronic metal poisoning. And they get it from a variety of sources. But um, basically, there, there are very different there are very different situations in chronic mental poisoning, and they have to be treated differently. Um, the, the synthetic chelating agents in patients who have chronic mental poisoning often result in very severe toxic reactions. Uh, one of the reasons is that they have low glutathione levels, which are depleted from the, the uh, chronic exposure to the metals. It takes three molecules of glutathione to excrete one molecule of a toxic metal. So you can see if you have a, a lot of amalgams in place and your body constantly has to utilize that glutathione, not just for the, for the detoxification and excretion, but also for the uh, squelching of, or the, uh, of these uh, free radicals that form. And that's one of the important uh, functions of glutathione. Uh, you, you get pretty pronounced depletion of glutathione. 
Now, in metal poisoning, it has a number of features that we see. There's the depletion of glutathione and other, other antioxidants. So these people are under a lot of oxidative stress. And, and you'll often see trace mineral abnormalities in these people. They often have multiple toxic metals rather than just one. Uh, there is extensive sequestration of toxic metals in various organs and tissues. A lot of it, mercury, for example, gets into the brain, lead and mercury get into the bones. Um, a lot of toxic metals will lodge in the heart, which is responsible for the high incidence of, of uh, cardiac failure. And there is a severe thyroid dysfunction usually. Anyone with uh, glutathione depletion will end up with thyroid dysfunction. Um, there's impaired chemical detoxification, impaired uh, and abnormal immune function, excessive free radical formation. Uh, you have the uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation and damage to the mitochondrial DNA and release of inflammatory cytokines. So you get chronic in inflammatory states. Uh, then you see many patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Uh, if you um, look at the literature on various diseases, you see that metal poisoning associated with cardiovascular disease, with cancer, with congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, autoimmune disorders, irritable, irritable bowel and leaky gut syndrome, chronic and recurrent infections, bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic infections, Lyme and Lyme disease and mycobacterial diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, chemical sensitivity, hypothyroidism, behavioral disorders like ADD and ADHD, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar illnesses, sleep disorders, degenerative neurological diseases, chronic neuropathies, skin disorders and hair loss, and various gastrointestinal disorders. Um, we see a lot of these really severe chronic infections like Lyme disease, candidiasis, chronic fungal and viral illnesses, mycoplasma infections, Gulf War illness, and now we're starting to see a a uh, huge increase in autistic spectrum disorders in the past few years. Now, this is a slide showing the mitochondria in itself. And um, there's an extraordinarily complex uh, structure with uh, it's kind of like an assembly line of enzymes and uh, we don't have time to go into the entire, into the various mechanisms that uh, occur. But anyway, the, the uh, mitochondrion is responsible for producing energy and when you can't produce energy, it, the mitochondrion produces free radicals. Uh, toxic metals inhibit sulfhydryl enzymes because of the powerful affinity for sulfur. They attack metabolic intermediates and cofactors containing sulfur. They impair the body's antioxidant defense mechanisms. Uh, free radicals stimulate the release of inflammatory cytokines and oncogenes, which end up causing cancer and there's impairment of neurotransmitter storage. You get various metabolic abnormalities such as gout and porphyria, and you can trigger autoimmune disorders and multiple allergies, which many people have. The depletion of glutathione actually triggers an alteration of immune function with a switch from a Th1 to a Th2 mode. And what, what do we mean by that? In the Th1 mode, the body makes white cells 
and natural killer cells that release nitric oxide, which are able to kill these uh, various pathogenic organisms. But in the Th2 in the Th2 mode, the body only makes antibodies and doesn't produce any nitric oxide. And the reason for that is the body can only utilize nitric oxide when it has plenty of glutathione to protect the body against oxidative stress because nitric oxide is, is a, a, an agent that produces a lot of oxidative stress for the body. And it's interesting that when the uh, AIDS epidemic first started back in the 60s, uh, a lot of the homosexuals who developed AIDS were using, they were using nitric oxide poppers to uh, enhance their, their uh, sexual uh, satisfaction and, and these created a tremendous amount of oxidative stress and undoubtedly precipitated glutathione depletion and then uh, they had a major problem with dealing with all kinds of viruses and fungi and all the rest of these organisms. There's a, a glutathione molecule and basically it's a tripeptide. It's composed of uh, uh, three separate amino acids linked up. Cysteine is the, uh, the important one with the sulfur in it and then there's a, a glutamate molecule and a glycine molecule and they're all linked together and this is a an extraordinarily, extraordinarily important uh, molecule for the, your body because your body depends on it for detoxification of metals and chemicals and for the quenching of free radicals. Now our government has an extraordinary web website at the ATSDR Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And you, you can go on this website and find e an enormous amount of information on toxic metals there. But, and, and in, on this website, they will tell you that these metals cause a, cause a variety of different diseases. But if you try to say that a chelating product of yours actually helps improve any of these diseases, they tell you you can't put that kind of information on your website. Um, now, there are a number of indicators of metal toxicity uh, which anybody can see. The number and size of your amalgam fillings, the pallor or, or grayish skin dis discoloration. Uh, if you see people with tremor and impaired balance and coordination, uh, dark discoloration on the underside of the tongue, dark discoloration under the eyes. Various, uh, nail abnormalities, hair loss in women, fatigued appearance, protub protuberant abdomen, and depression and impaired memory. These are uh, clinical signs. They're not specific, but taken together, they're, they're usually they would give a person a pretty good indication that there's a problem. There are various tests that can be done. A lot of doctors like to use blood tests and unfortunately, blood tests are not very accurate for chronic metal toxicity. They're fine for acute poisoning. And the reason is that the toxic metals are rapidly cleared from the blood and they get deposited in your joints and in your kidneys and heart and various other organs, including your brain and also in your bones. So that, um, for example, during, right after this uh, episode on 9-11, a lot of the workers got sick and um, a lot of the doctors who were looking at them were doing blood tests and they couldn't find anything much wrong with them. 
but there was a clinic that was doing hair analysis and they found large amounts of mercury in these patients and treated them and those people actually got, got well or at least markedly improved. So blood tests are not a good way of looking for chronic metal poisoning. Uh, some doctors use provocative urinary excretion using potent chelating agents like DMPS and DMSA. And those have two problems. One is you can precipitate a really severe uh, reaction uh, in a person with glutathione depletion and many of these patients complain of severe fatigue after getting one of these procedures and some of them will have severe immune suppression. Um, you can do a uh, provocative stool test um, and a lot of doctors really don't do that um, although it is a helpful test. Uh, we find the most practical one is hair analysis because it shows you uh, the person's exposure over a period of months. Uh, it's a good reflection of body, metal body burden and it's uh, very accurate if the Interpretation includes recognition of trace mineral derangement. Um, another test you can do is oral mercury vapor test. And we do that, uh, we're doing that at, at our booth. And if you'd like to stop by, we'll be happy to do it for you. Uh, indicates uh, pretty much your daily mercury vapor exposure. Uh, and it's a, it's a useful test. Uh, your mercury vapor level increases, of course, whenever you chew or when you drink hot liquids or eat hot foods. And uh, if you brush your teeth, it'll probably triple your release of mercury from those fillings. <coughs> now, um, we define a chelator as an agent that removes or enhances the natural excretion of toxic metals from the body. And it does this usually by causing the formation of a stable complex of lesser toxicity, which can then be excreted from the body. Uh, there are various forms of chelation, intravenous chelation, the EDTA, DMPS, and DMSA. And, and you can do oral chelation using those same agents and also using natural substances. Now, there's some problems with intravenous chelation. It is very good for acute poisoning, but it requires an experienced physician uh, supervising in a clinical, in a clinic setting. Side effects are common due to the depletion of glutathione and other antioxidants. It's really uh, Pretty costly, actually, $2,500 to $4,000. And uh, these are powerful prescription agents. Now, oral prescription chelation, it can be done at home. Uh, it does require a prescription and physician supervision. You can't use DMPS and DMSA if amalgams are present. and. Uh, there's a high incidence of side effects. The EDTA is not effective at all for mercury. And many people have had EDTA chelation. And it does work if you don't have mercury. Um, mercury itself is a major cause of, of uh, arterial, arterial damage and arteriosclerosis. Um, so you, many people have EDTA and expect to get perfectly well and, uh, and are disappointed, actually. Um, and of course, synthetic chelators are tolerated poorly in people with chemical sensitivity. Um, my own choice, uh, because I saw so many chemically sensitive people and because I was chemically sensitive, was to use natural oral chelation. And this uh, can be done at home. It doesn't re require a prescription. It can be used even if your amalgam fillings are in place. 
It has a low incidence of side effects and is inexpensive. Some formulas can remove toxic metals from the brain, and um, we've had good success with that. Uh, the, uh, it's clearly the best thing for chemically sensitive people. Uh, these are the ingredients we have in our product, which we call Keylorex. We use cilantro, chlorella, MSM, taurine, alpha lipoic acid, NHC, glutamine, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, magnesium, and selenium. And each one of these has a, a particular function. The cilantro is wonderful for mobilizing toxic metals from the central nervous system. But if you try to use it all by itself without anything else, you can have a big redis redistribution of, of the mercury, for example, into other parts of the body. And uh, the chlorella has been used. It traps the toxic metals in the GI tract and acts like an ion exchange resin. The MSM uh, enhances the permeability of cell membranes and reduces inflammation, especially joint inflammation. And the taurine is, enhances biliary excretion. It protects the, the brain, the retina, and the white blood cells. So all of these has a separate function. And used together, they're quite formidable. The alpha lipoic acid, NAC, and uh, glutamine enhance the, they raise glutathione levels, and the glutamine actually restores and preserves gastrointestinal function. Um, vitamin C and E and selenium are all important antioxidants. There's zinc stimulates metallothionine and reduces the toxicity of metals. Magnesium also reduces toxicity and aids in the chelation by replacing lost or chelated magnesium. It, it, the selenium enhances mercury detoxification a great deal. It reduces toxicity of metals and it's necessary for the conversion of T4 to T3. We've done, uh, we've studied the Keeler X for about five years now, and um, basically one of the major things we found was that we were able to enhance toxic metal excretion through the gastrointestinal tract by about almost 1,300%, whereas very, there's very little increase in urinary excretion. And so it's very protective of kidney function. And uh, over a period of years, we've tested many, many people on the, on the product and we're able to show reductions of all the different toxic metals. Um, this is a book on uh, hair test interpretation, which has been very helpful for us because it really makes the hair analysis much more accurate. And uh, we, have, uh, we have this book at our booth, which you can buy. Or, and, and we also have many charts which we can use to explain how to, how to diagnose trace mineral derangement and how to interpret it. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's kind of difficult to see. These, these are some charts that show trace mineral derangement. And you can see in this person, if you look at his trace minerals, there are only four metals on the right-hand side of the chart. And the rest are pretty low. And that's a typical sign of trace mineral derangement. And then when we put them on the Keylorex and got rid of a lot of the toxic metals. And you can see that he started, he had an increase in the number of toxic metals being excreted on the, on the right. And um, you see here on the upper part that there was an increase in the excretion of the toxic metals once the derangement was, was corrected. 
Here's a, another patient who had uh, a lot of toxic metal. And you can see on this one side of the chart, there's only one, two, three, four of the trace minerals showing up. And after chelation, we see that there are many more showing up on that side. And then on the top, you can see that there, some of the metals are a little bit decreased and some of the metals have actually increased so that uh, the body is able to excrete these better than before. And you see, a, if you look at the total toxic representation, it's come down here. Here's a, another patient. Um, this person had a lot of, uh, looks like bismuth and cadmium. Uh, he didn't have any trace mineral, trace mineral derangement, which means that the top chart is correct. This is an accurate representation of his toxic metals. And you can see that uh, the Keeler X brought down his trace minerals very nicely. And his total toxic representation went from all the way out to the end here to uh, a little past the green zone into the yellow zone. So that was a big improvement. And he had some really major reductions in, in this. Uh, it's hard to read this, actually. But I think it was 91% decrease in uh, bismuth and about 45% decrease in the lead or cadmium, I guess. 67% um, decrease in the tin. And there was a 61% decrease in the let's see, what's that? That's um, Titanium. And these are some more of the similar things where you have um, dramatic reductions in, in the trace minerals after three months of chelation. Here's a fellow who had a, a whole lot of mercury and some lead. And this particular man had had 10 IV DMSA treatments with some very severe side effects. And he had been having increasing fatigue, impairment of concentration, anxiety, and difficulty with balance. And he had a pretty high mercury level, 3.5 micrograms. And after getting treated with Keelorex for one cap with 10 pounds of body weight for 90 days, his mercury level was decreased to a, less than a third of what, what it had been before, and he had a, a big improvement in all his symptoms. Here's a 52-year-old female who is an optician, and she was having severe fatigue, impaired concentration, impaired fine motor coordination, high-pitched tinnitus, pain in the elbow, lower back, swelling of her body, hard nodules along her tibia, and chronic constipation. And you can see tremendous elevation of antimony, cadmium, lead, nickel, silver, tin, and titanium here. It's just huge levels all the way out to the end with some of these. And uh, she uh, actually took only uh, about half the regular dose, so in, in times of only a third. And you see after 18 months, she had a big reduction in just about all of these things. And there's, there was a major improvement in all her symptoms. That probably saved her life. Um, here's a lady who had IV chelation with EDTA. And after finishing the IV chelation, you can see her mercury level is out to here. So again, I have to repeat that EDTA does not work for mercury. And here's 
Again, the before with the mercury out to here and then after her mercury is down to here. And she did this in about 45 days, uh, taking two doses a day of the Keelorex. Um, here's just another one, an elderly man with uh, very high doses of cadmium and lead and mercury, and you can see after. And he did this for about a year, I guess. And you can see his levels are all nicely down. And uh, another person who had not severe elevation, but moderate elevation, and had a very nice response. You can see these are just about all in the green zone now. Uh, we've done some urinary studies, and of course it does show a, de a nice decrease. And uh, the dosage level, again, is one capital per 10 pounds. So a 180 person would take either nine caplets morning and evening, or they might want to take six tablets three times a day. Uh, or you could take all 18 at once if you, if you desire. It's small and you can swallow five at a time. Um, and we recommend people drink a lot of water and uh, to continue until your metal levels are in an acceptable range. If you're constantly exposed to metal in your work or in your environment, then you really should be on a maintenance dose of it. And by that we mean usually two to six tablets twice a day, and that helps to prevent heavy metal toxicity. Um, how long do you have to take it? Well, it depends on how bad your toxic metal load is and whether or not you have trace mineral derangement. And uh, for the person with low to medium toxicity, 90 doses of it usually works well. Uh, for people with higher level of toxicity, they may have to take it uh, for a lot longer. They may have to take it for up to a year, actually. Uh, six months for some, nine months for others. Um, we've used it as an adjunct to IV chelation. And it's very helpful because it really enhances the range of metals removed. It reduces the adverse reactions. It gives antioxidant prote protection. It preserves your mitochondrial function, minimizes re redistribution of toxic metals, and it avoids the toxic metal overload on the kidney. Uh, of course, we formulated it for toxic metal poisoning, uh, whereas the synthetic agents were formulated mainly for acute. Um, I think we probably covered all these. Um, it does provide safe and effective mobilization of the toxic metals by enhancing the natural mechanisms of excretion to the biliary tract and it avoids the toxic overload associated with synthetic chelators. You have multiple potent antioxidants protecting against free radical damage. Um, they had some studies in the literature with people actually did, did uh, studies on rats and showing that uh, you could actually produce brain damage by mobilizing, um, mobilizing toxic metals when the glutathione level was very low. Um, you get this marked enhancement of GI excretion and uh, protection against reabsorption of toxic metals from the GI tract. And you protect, the kidney da protect against kidney damage. Um, you get the entire spectrum of toxic metals removed. 
It's probably the most cost-effective of chelators. It's the only oral chelating agent with significant clinical studies. Because most of the chelators out there have no studies. I mean, you can't, you can't find any. And there's, there's one uh, chelating agent that's sold where they, you, if you go to their website, you see that they have one patient that they studied. At least that's the only one that they presented. Um, so you can, it can be used safely for long-term protection of people who have to sustain environmental exposure. And it contains both water-soluble agents and lipid-soluble agents capable of penetrating the blood-brain barrier and the cell, cell membrane so that central nervous system and intracellular metals can be mobilized efficiently. Safely lowers mercury levels in persons with amalgam fillings. Can be used to protect persons before, during, and after amalgam replacement. And the absence of EDTA avoids the risk of neurotoxic complex formation with mercury reported by Dur et al. And um, again, excretion is primarily intestinal. This is a paper, uh, this is the abstract of that Dura paper in pharmacology. And it just talks about the fact that EDTA forms the co toxic complex with mercury. Probably it's not easy to see. Anyway, there are certain myths that uh, really promote illness. and. Um, a lot of people think their doctor can cure their illnesses, and, and that's a myth because there hasn't been a single disease cured in 100 years, and I don't think they plan to cure any either. Um, another one, another myth is that pharmaceutical drugs are beneficial to your health, and, and there's no way they can be beneficial to your health. I mean, they can give you temporary relief of your symptoms in some instances, but Inevitably, over a period of time, it's going to create a major problem for you. Um, another myth is that vaccines are a good way to prevent illness. And uh, unfortunately, they're not. They haven't been studied well. They are the source of many problems and much chronic disease. Um, they have been contaminated frequently with with uh, various viruses and other substances. Uh, and um, certainly people in the military who've gotten multiple max vaccines have ended up with very uh, severe health problems. Uh, another myth is that medical practice is scientific. And um, I guess that would depend on your viewpoint, but it's scientific if if 50-year-old science is acceptable to you. But, but unfortunately, uh, medical practice is really 50 to 70 years behind the medical science, behind real science. Um, another myth is that the FDA ensures the safety of foods and drugs. And um, really, the, as I'm sure most of you realize the FDA is a, an arm of the pharmaceutical industry. So here's uh, Big Pharma and the FDA is their puppet. Uh, nutritional myths. Saturated fats and cholesterol are the cause of obesity and cardiovascular disease. And people have been eating saturated fats and cholesterol for thousands of years, and they never had all these diseases that we have. Um, another myth, polyunsaturated fats are healthy. Unfortunately, the polyunsaturated fats that are sold uh, are not healthy. Polyunsaturated fats are actually present in most whole foods, and you don't need a lot of them if you get enough healthy fats like saturated or monounsaturated fats coconut oil and uh, even plain old 
stearic acid from beef is fine if you have grass-fed beef. Um, um, another myth is margarine is a health food. How many people eat margarine here? Uh, I hope you don't eat margarine. Uh, another myth is that raw milk is dangerous. And when people um, actually drink raw milk, it enhances their health. And they've done studies of, in animals of, of uh, feeding animals raw milk versus pasteurized, homogenized milk. And the rats getting the raw milk are really healthy and have beautiful coats and have really sweet temperaments and they like to be petted. And the animals that get the pasteurized milk, uh, they have uh, bad coats and bare spots on their coats and they're, they're scrawny and they look unhealthy and they're very irritable and they bite people. And uh, Clearly it's not, a, not really a health food. Another um, myth is that artificial sweeteners are a safe way to promote weight loss. And what people don't realize is all these artificial sweeteners are appetite stimulants and they all release insulin. And so you're getting the same effects that you would from sugar in a sense, but they have an additional effect. They all cause mitochondrial dysfunction and they all uh, are addictive and the uh, aspartame, for example, will cause uh, brain malfunctions and even brain tumors. And uh, Splenda has been found to cause uh, thymus suppression and so it causes uh, immune dysfunction. So these are really bad things. Um, Another myth is that eggs and liver on, are unhealthy. But if you find a good source of eggs from a farmer who lets his chickens run around and eat grass, the eggs are exceptionally healthy. And um, even supermarket liver is better than no liver because liver is not a storage organ. Um, it has a multitude of important nutrients in it, especially uh, a lot of vitamin A and vitamin D. Another myth is that soy is a health food. Uh, soy is one of the most dangerous foods you can eat, especially for pregnant women. Pregnant women who eat soy can produce children who are irritable, who are not well, uh, not comfortable in social environments, and who don't do well on IQ tests. Uh, and the same is true uh, when animals were tested on, uh, on pregnant, pregnant animals on soy, the same kind of thing happened. Uh, soy is responsible for a, a lot of different problems. It's very estrogenic. It should never be given to babies. They've had cases of infants, female infants developing breasts. In the case of male infants, male infants normally have a really high level of testosterone. And that's to enable the brain to develop in a male fashion, because male and female brains are different. And then when these kids get to be, uh, to reach puberty, they don't develop normally. And you may get boys who like playing with dolls, uh, boys who are really effeminate, and, or who are homosexual, and this is a, a major problem. So soy is not a good food for children. The other problem with soy given to babies is it has no cholesterol. And cholesterol is a really important nutrient. It has an antioxidant effect. It actually is very important for the development of the brain and for the gastrointestinal tract. And children who are given soy milk instead of regular milk uh, tend to have GI problems, they have leaky gut syndrome. They often have uh, problems in their uh, intellectual development. So if you have a relative or a friend who wants to feed their baby soy milk, tell them absolutely not. It has way too much estrogen, it has an antithyroid effect, 
It has 10 times the amount of aluminum as cow's milk, and it's a disaster. Uh, a couple more myths. Vitamin D and A are dangerous substances. They are some of the most important substances uh, for your bone development, for your immune system. Uh, Uh, for your, uh, your general health, for your thyroid function. Uh, another myth is that processed grains and dry cereals are okay, and they're not healthy foods. Uh, another myth that the uh, government has tried to lay on us is that sunlight is bad and causes cancer. And the fact of the matter is sunlight is essential for people to have adequate levels of vitamin D. And the other thing is, the people who develop cancer don't do it because they have vitamin, because they get exposed to sunlight. It's because they have basically bad diets and they're exposed to all kinds of food additives and uh, soy protein and a whole bunch of other uh, toxic substances. Uh, another myth is that blood tests are accurate. Blood tests are often very misleading. For one thing, they're based on statistical analyses. And if you have a large population in which there is a um, vitamin deficiency, for example, the normal levels are skewed way, way down low because so many people are vitamin deficient. So when they do the tests, they tell you, oh, your, your B12, your folic acid level is normal when it may be three, milligram, three nanograms per milliliter for, for your folate and maybe uh, 200 picograms per milliliter for your B12. But those are extremely low levels. And uh, it's just that they're considered normal because so many people have low levels in the population. Uh, I used to test folate and B12 on every patient who walked in and I found that half the patient population had low levels of B12 or folate or both. Um, and it's responsible for an enormous amount of, of neurological and psychiatric disease. Uh, a big myth is that fluoride is good for your health. And obviously, it's not good for your health. It depresses your thyroid, it affects the structure of your bones and teeth, it makes your bones and teeth very brittle. Um, it's not good for your, the development of your brain. Um, it's a big problem. Another problem is food additives. They are not safe. And of course, many things have multiple food additives. And when you start multiplying them and you, you give a whole bunch of different food a additives to animals, the animals actually die. So these are not safe. Um, OK. I don't know if do we have time for a couple of questions? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Greenberg will be available for taking some questions. We apologize. Uh, it's hard to get as much data in a, just a short of presentation as he's presented today. I think he's done a fabulous job of covering uh, a myriad of topics right now. And uh, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Greenberg, uh, get, uh, just outside the double doors here, uh, he'll entertain them. We're going to take a, a short 10 minute break. And uh, we'll be back on uh, in just a few minutes with uh, uh, Tracy Tucker. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Sir. Thank you. Oh, also a, uh, a short.